importantly, introducing you to some of our world-class faculty. And today we have the real honour of having Professor Lena Starlander speaking to you about his work. So who am I, first of all? My name is Rebecca Lowe's and I'm responsible for our portfolio of MBA programmes, of which the Global Online MBA is one. I will be coming back to you later to tell you a little bit about the programme, but I do not want to stand between you and learning about our research. So who we were talking to today? It is actually Professor Linus Dahlander. Uh, Linus got his PhD from Tolmans University, which is in Sweden. He also was an assistant professor, has been a research fellow at, at Imperial College London, and did his postdoc at Stanford University in the US before coming to ESMT Berlin in 2011. Now, his particular areas of research around crowdsourcing, open innovation and networks, and he's been published in leading academic journals such as the Academy of Management. Now, Linus teaches in our MBA programs, in our executive MBA programs with executives. And if you haven't already found this, I would really recommend because his videos that he recorded with the rapper Dex McBean, kind of summarizing his entrepreneurship course and his innovation course, these have become the stuff of legend. And so therefore, with no further ado, it is an absolute pleasure to hand over to Linus to talk to you today. Over to you, Linus. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, I will share uh, the videos afterwards for anyone interested. My goal uh, today is to give you an introduction about some of the research that we're doing at ESMT. And I think it's also nice in making the connection between uh, theory and practice. Uh, this is a product that I've been working on with some amazing colleagues. And it's also something I'm actually using in the classroom. So this evening at six, I'm teaching for our global online MBA students. And we're actually gonna talk about some of the stuff that I'm gonna cover now in much greater detail. And I think it's also nice because it also gives you some reflections about how you can work more efficiently as a manager as well. And the topic that I'm going to discuss is something on a product on autonomy and entrepreneurial teams. Their research is actually now published. It's out in one of the major journals called Organization Science. And I think one thing that I realized pretty early on in my academic career is that these academic journals are incredibly hard to get into. And they also have the luxury, have a readership of three, your, uh, your mom, your dad, and yourself. And my mom is not a vivid academic reader of these kinds of papers. So I also try to make a concerted effort in converting this into more managerially relevant articles. So this particular one also came out as a summary in Harvard Business Review afterwards. Um, and the topic of this particular paper is this idea of autonomy. So what is autonomy? Autonomy is granting you the ability to make some decisions of your own independently of a manager above you in a hierarchy. And I think many people have sort of alluded to the fact that autonomy is super important, not the least for creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship. So here's one quote from the Forbes, like if you love your employees, set them free. Autonomy is key to employee engagement. And also on the other side is this idea of like how, if you wanna kill your uh, team's creativity, uh, take away all the autonomy that is essentially needed to get stuff done and to help people to coordinate amongst themselves. Many companies have also started to realize this. I think obviously many entrepreneurial companies, companies have this ability where you have the luxury of choosing your collaborators, choosing the ideas that you want to work on, but even larger companies are tinkering around with this. I think the most known example is uh, Daimler, Sappos, Valve, Morningstar, which sort of alludes to the fact that it's not only like the software companies, but also a company essentially developing tomato juice or tomato cans of different kinds that can do this. The Orphis uh, came, uh, Cambro Orchestra, Gore for different kinds of materials, GitHub, a large software company and so forth. And what makes an entrepreneurial team successful? And I think there are two different views on why that actually happens. And I think the one, uh, that is often sort of championed by venture capitalists and business angels in Berlin and elsewhere is this point that if you just have the right team members, it doesn't matter the kind of idea that you have. It's all about you having the ability to pick the best team members on your team. And then almost if you have a relatively second tier idea, you're going to be successful because you can overcome the hurdles collectively as a team. 
other people are actually pointing in a direction that maybe this is a bit sort of exaggerated and everyone wants to point to the fact that teams are important when it's also about the fact that some ideas may be better than others. And both of them get to this idea that, look, in an entrepreneurship setting, you have the luxury of choosing both the people that you want to work with and choosing an idea that you want to work with. In most organizations, this is not the case. Then you have a manager above you in hierarchy, tell them, Rebecca, you need to work with this person on this particular kind of topic. So you have almost the opposite contrast to this particular case. And again, hierarchies often assign people to teams and tasks. Sometimes we're being told, do this particular project with this particular person, report afterwards how it actually went. And in entrepreneurship settings, you actually have this luxury of choosing team members and the ideas and the tasks that you are going to work. This obviously opens a very uh, interesting question about how does choosing versus assigning people to teams and ideas affect the team performance? Is it necessarily the case that just because you're given the complete freedom of choosing the people that you want to work with and the ideas that you're outperforming the ones that don't get any freedom whatsoever, or is there some kind of match in between that maybe that's the silver bullet that you're after? A good experiment to answer this question requires an, uh, uh, sorry, a good answer to this requires an experiment. And I think experiments matters more generally because correlation is not causation. If we would do it for these firemen, like uh, then you could sort of wrongly assume that firemen is causing fires when in reality they go into where the fires are. The experiment that we run to answer this question is a very simple one. So we let some people choose the team members that they're going to work with. Others just get randomly assigned. We let some people having the opportunity to choose the entrepreneurial idea that they're going to work on during uh, a lean startup inspired class. And other people get assigned to a particular idea of a similar kind of quality. If you put this together, it ends up with one of these beautiful two by two matrices where some people uh, maybe have uh, the utmost luxury of having the ability to choose both the team members and the ideas. Some people, maybe you think about them as the unfortunate ones, have the ability to not choose either the team members or the idea that they're gonna work on. Then there's some people who have the ability to choose the idea, but they get randomly assigned to a team. And some people get to choose the team members, but they get randomly assigned to an idea. The question is, of course, is that which one of these particular boxes outperforms and why is this the case? So we run this in a Lean Startup Inspired class. We do it with 300 different kinds of teams. We have randomization and we do all kinds of uh, sophisticated methods to answer this question. What do we find moving ahead over all the methods that we actually do? If you take performance on uh, the y-axis ranging from low to high and a different condition on the x-axis, choose neither, choose team, choose idea, and choose both, pretty unsurprisingly, the ones that are not granted any autonomy whatsoever have the lowest performance. So choose neither have the lowest performance. But what we do find is that those people who have the ability to choose the idea, but they get randomly assigned to a team, outperforms those people who have the ability to choose both the team members and the idea. So in other words, what this suggests is that Oftentimes people pick worse than random. So, and I think there are many logical explanations for this. If I would pick an entrepreneurial team, I would overweight my friends, very close colleagues, and I may not necessarily get the spice that is required to actually create an amazing entrepreneurial idea. So what's going on here? It could be something about like different levels of autonomy and different kinds of the treatment arms that I discussed lead to performance. And there's something in between that actually happens. And our study actually allows us to get into the details for why this happened. And the first thing that we find is that those people who have the ability to choose the idea, pretty unsurprisingly, have a better fit with the team skills. So if I get to choose an idea, I'm going to do it in the base of my expertise. I happen to know something about higher education and nerdy methods. Maybe I would put an idea there and therefore, as a result, perform better afterwards. Those people who have the ability to choose the team, they choose their friends way too much, which in turn lowers their performance. And I think there are quite a few other kind of research that actually points in this direction that even people who are incredibly well motivated to find the best and new collaborators actually choose their friends to a much 
too, way too much in order to come up with productive and new kinds of ideas that can actually help them in the long run. And the third one, and I think this is an interesting one, is that those people who have the ability to choose both the team members and the ideas are super confident about the idea. When we ask them afterwards, like, how likely are you to continue with the idea? All of them loved their idea. Many of them were incredibly likely to continue after the class. They wanted to go out and look for funding and so forth. But essentially what we could show is that that leads to overconfidence. So these people are super happy. They're amazingly happy about the experience. They think the class is the best thing ever. But it almost leads to the point where confidence leads to overconfidence. So they think too highly of their own idea, which in turn lowers their performance. And I think this suggests something that actually goes beyond this particular experiment and something that can help you in daily life as well. And I think the lesson here is that don't get stuck in an echo chamber. And I think our results suggest that autonomy and choice makes people happier, but it actually has very little effect on the performance as the long, in the long run. And I think these random encounters that happens when we randomly assign people to teams can provide incredibly deep and long living connections. It could be the case that you get some frictions in the way, but when we get to choose, chances are that we're going to pick very familiar collaborators to us. So what our results suggest is this idea that some autonomy is best, but not too much. So it's not this extreme case that, oh, give people all the autonomy in the world or don't provide any autonomy whatsoever, but somewhere in between in the shades of gray is the best answer to actually have the highest entrepreneurial performance. And I think there are three important self-reflections for you that I hope you can take away beyond this particular experiment. And I think the first one is this idea of thinking about the company and the organizations which you work in and ask yourself, are you building structures that are aligned with the goal of being more entrepreneurial? And I think uh, what our results show here is that, look, you would like to give people some autonomy, but the case of just providing all autonomy in the world is not necessarily important. And what really seems to dominate here is this ability to have some kind of autonomy of the kind of work that you do, the ideas that you work with, but helping people to forge some random connections can actually be useful for performance. And the other thing is this a question of whether you have a healthy balance between providing autonomy to your team and expanding their perspective. And I think the downside of autonomy is this point of people choosing familiar collaborators. And what you would like to do is also encourage these random connections or some spice into the collaborations by expanding their perspective of meeting someone that they haven't met in the past. And think about this during the pandemic, I was probably one of the worst in this, that I deepened my collaborations with my friends, my colleagues that I've known for a long time. But it was very rare to have one of these new friends that you haven't seen in the past, the kinds of people that you meet by the water cooler or when you go to have a coffee and a break, and one of these random encounters that can actually help you in the long run. And I think the third one that I like about this is this deeper point about like, how do we find good answers? And I think there are many consultants out there that would like to sell like a very simple answer or simple answers to very difficult kinds of questions. And the nice thing about running experiments and thinking about experimentation in the settings where you work is to actually get very good evidence uh, of the kinds of interventions that could potentially help you in the workplace. And I think this is a nice example of how you can use experiments to make sure that you actually base your decisions not on gut feeling, but on real evidence to help you as a manager the most. That's everything I wanted to cover. Uh, that was a very quick introduction. For those who are interested in knowing more about the research, please reach out to me, send an email, connect on LinkedIn, and you can just scan this particular thing up here and you can connect to me on LinkedIn. I would be more than happy to stay in touch. And also a promise from me to you guys, if anyone applies for one of our programs, get admitted or something like this, um, please let me know afterwards. And I promise to take you to lunch or dinner in Berlin afterwards. That's everything I wanted to say. And I hand over to Rebecca. Thank you.
Thank you, Linus. I think that's absolutely excellent. What a lovely, lovely taster of what you're teaching in the Global Online MBA and also your general style. And I think that everyone can agree exactly why you are much beloved by our students. And we are very lucky to have you. And I think some, some thumbs going up there. So thank you so much. Uh, so for the second part of the session, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the actual program itself. Um, at the end, please post questions that you may have in the Q&A and we will get to them. If you have questions for Linus, please post them there as well. Um, but first of all, let's just do a little bit of a little dive into the Global Online MBA program. Um, the program itself is, is a general management program. This is what ESMT does. However, you've got the ability to tailor it with technology, with innovation electives such as those offered by Linus uh, and Global Experience. And what we do in terms of the ESMT Berlin, we are a young, agile school. We have strengths in our three pillars are analytics, innovation and leadership. And so these all really come together in the Global Online MBA program. Now, as a potential student, you would be joining the global ESMT community. ESMT is actually the number one business school in Germany. We are triple accredited. And something that which does come up a lot, particularly in our online MBA students, is you will be earning an ESMT MBA. The learning modality is not something that appears on your certificate. So therefore, you are learning in the same program, which is also in our full time or in our part time program. Now, the program itself is a fully online program, which means that if you wish, you do not have to set foot on the Berlin campus, but we will have opportunities for you to come and visit. So you can take Linus up on that invitation for lunch and dinner. Uh, now, when you are not here in person, you will be studying on the Hub, which is a learning platform. This is something that was developed by and for business schools. And it really is a way in which we have partnering with our learning designers. We really ensure that we're ahead and we're keeping pace with what is going on and changing. So you will have a highly interactive experience. I think one of the things which always really surprises our online MBA students is that, yes, you are studying in an online program. There's a lot of group work. You are working in teams all the time. The hub is under your focus, but effectively you're using multiple modalities in order to progress through the program. But what will you actually be studying? Um, so a kind of like as a, as a top line overview of what the program is, uh, what we do, the structure of the program is quite unique uh, and it's something that we're really proud of. So everybody will start with the first module, which is managing the connected world. This is almost, it's a slightly shorter module, it's slightly lighter. Um, and this is really because, you know, you're working. There's a minimum of three years of work experience to apply to the program. You're working. You may have not studied for a while. So this is to ease you into it gently and also to start you learning some of the really good behaviors. So this will be looking at how you're working in a global virtual team and also setting you up in terms of giving an introduction to general management. We then have four core modules. And what we've done with these modules is actually we've created them so that they can help you answer a pressing business issue. Um, so around decision making, around oh, your strategy, around how do I understand my organization? How about my market? And it's really these themes which bring together three courses. So you will look at a business challenge from three different perspectives. Um, and then we have electives. Uh, and so these are your opportunities to really start tailoring the program to what you want. And then as with all of our MBA programs, you have a capstone final project. Now, this final project, I think, is a win for you and a win for your employer. Ideally, we'd like you to actually do this with your employer. So you go to your boss, your senior leadership team and say, What's a business challenge that you would like me to investigate? Do you have any strategic questions that you're looking at? Are there any big decisions coming up that I can work on? This is your opportunity to therefore show how you have developed over the course of the program, because at that final project, you're teasing in, you're bringing all of the learning that you've had and you're applying it this to this business issue. Your boss, your company gets to have an actual business problem resolved. And you demonstrate how far your thinking has changed, how your perspective has changed, how the value you're bringing to the business has changed. And that opens up new opportunities. So I think it's really exciting. And one of the other things I really like about the Global Online MBA is that you are working and learning in parallel. 
which means you also have a fantastic opportunity to take what you're learning, to apply it to what you're doing, to see what works. And if it doesn't, or you're seeing something funky, then you can kind of talk to faculty like, what on earth is going on here? Help me understand. So this ability to kind of immediately apply what you're learning is something which I think is kind of an additional value point for an online MBA or a part-time MBA program. So if we dig a little bit more into the curriculum, uh, and I've just said, you know, I've talked a little bit around it. Um, and so I'll use the example uh, to demonstrate this idea of this holistic approach to a particular topic. And let's think about decision making. Now, you can think about decision making, first of all, from a data perspective. You know, a lot of us, you know, digitization, we're really looking at how can we extract value from data. So very much, OK, let's look into the numbers and let's see what data points we have. What do they indicate that we should possibly do? Now, that's one part of decision making. But even if you decided, OK, we're going to think about doing course of action A, that actually happens within the context of an organization. And so therefore, it's really around how do we as an organization make decisions? What makes sense? How do we think about that? But then if you step back even further, any organization is actually doing this within a much broader context. So the data may say one thing, the organization says, actually, yes, we can do this. But is that the right thing to do? And that's where ethics and responsibility comes in around this idea of responsible leadership and what should you be doing? And so really, I hope that I've given you kind of like a little sense of, of how we're approaching particular topics. I mentioned that there are electives. We have multiple electives that you can choose from, and you can choose three, of which there are some which are offered by ourselves. You have an opportunity to come to Berlin for an experience week. We have a global experiences week as well, which actually takes place next week. Uh, and our students are in South Africa. So learning about doing business in South Africa. You also are, have access to network courses offered by more than 30 schools, which are part of the global network for advanced management. So that means you could take a small network, network online course at, say, Yale. He talked to Bashi at Igade. So we have, you know, there is a fantastic roster of schools. So you can also use that to build your network. So what are we looking for? So if we've whetted your appetite, uh, what are we actually looking for in our candidates? As with any of our MBA programs, what we are really looking is for those of you who are effectively, you know, so we're looking for excellence. We're looking for kind of high potentials. Those of you who have an international outlook, who are kind of like strong intercultural competence. Um, and also one of the things which I think really unites an ESMT MBA students in a real characteristic is that not only are you wanting or ready to invest in your own personal development, but you're also ready to invest in the personal development of those that you're studying with. Now, you're thinking, well, why does this really matter? This matters because a lot of an MBA program is not just learning from our fantastic faculty. It's also learning from each other. You have centuries of experience in that classroom if you add up everyone's work experience in different industries, in different functions and in different countries and cultures. The idea in an MBA program is that you're only you're also learning from each other. So I want you to come to that program ready to share the knowledge you've acquired in your role, industry and function and learn from others as well. So that's so important to us. Now, hard kind of, you know, admission criteria, at least three years of work experience. We do need, you know, you do need to have a first degree. That is a requirement. Um, and then you can see the details there. We have two intakes. The program starts in May and September and some deadlines are coming up. So I really would encourage you to submit your application. Um, or if you're not ready to do that, then talk to us. You know, we are here, admissions at esmt.org. Please get in touch, set up a consultation. Um, one of the things that you will learn when you become a student at ESMT or through this process is that we really do appreciate or we, 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 we like to practice a personal touch. So you will see that we are all very approachable. We really do enjoy speaking to you to learn more, to make certain that this program is the right fit for you and will help you achieve what you wish with your career. Now, I've seen some questions coming in. Uh, and so therefore, let me have a look at what we have. Um, and so therefore, we get So the first question. I'm going to stop my share here so you can see us. So these are both curriculum questions. 
Um, so the first one is how can we ensure that we can join and build a community just as strong as the full-time MBA students and alumni? This is something that you may be a global online MBA student, or not even you are a global online MBA student, you are still invited to all of our events. So if you are based in Berlin and Germany, you are welcome to come on campus. We also do a lot of events which are offered in hybrid and blended mode specifically so that we can include our students who are not located here, because we also have executive MBA students who may not be based here. We have part-time MBA students, and it's really important to us to bring you in. We also arrange, you can do something which is basically, uh, we do coffee mornings or coffee exchanges so that we can help build connections between you and other students on other courses. Um, we also have uh, social events, which are online social events as well. So we really do a lot of work to make sure that you are integrated into our community and that you feel part of our community because that's really important because you are part of our community. Um, Another question is like, would it possible to take more than one module at the same time? Uh, I would say yes, as long as you're not working. I mean, this is, we are, you are getting an academically rigorous MBA. It's about 15 hours a week of work. So it really is something that we haven't yet had a student who has managed to do two modules in it at a go. Uh, this is something, of course, that I would say talk to us to see. I would recommend trying a module first before you decide to go all in because it's a pretty intense experience. Then we have typical MBA programs of teaching people marketing, accounting, et cetera, where they learn the financial basics. This is all woven within the program. We have just thematically arranged it so that you're learning about this, but you're learning about it from multiple perspectives. So not only are you learning about, say, marketing or accounting in isolation, it's really how these fit together because this is a general management program. The goal is to help you understand the full plethora of business, but then to actually add on your particular take or flavor in terms of electives. And we have one more question, uh, and this is from Anonymous. So how many people get into the program? What's the acceptance rate for the online MBA? Uh, I think the acceptance rate, I think is about 70%. We do, you know, it's like you need to actually meet our um, our admission criteria. Uh, everyone is interviewed. It's really important that we are able to fully evaluate you, that you meet our standards. Um, and so therefore, and actually a lot of people typically, which we see with, you know, any part-time program, the acceptance rate, as in if we make you an offer, we typically find a lot of people accept them because you, you're, you, you tend to be a little more focused and a bit more discerning. And so you're applying maybe to us or one other program. And so therefore, we see kind of a high acceptance rate in terms of us making you an offer and you accepting. Now, we've kind of come to our full half hour. So we've come to the end of the session. One more question around the typical week. So. Um, I will we I would recommend posting these questions. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much. The recording will be available. It's been an absolute delight. I'm very pleased to have you. We will be having our next third Thursday will be taking place in May and I would like to invite you to join if you haven't already submitted your application or even if you have. And thank you once again to Linus for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye everyone.